is really 2.8 billion TT dollars. If this record is not corrected now, the Minister of Finance himself will quote this wrong figure in the next two to three years as the true outcome of his performance in 2011. Correct it now. It is not 2.89 billion US, it is 2.89 TT. Big difference. The development program. Mr. Speaker, of all the shortcomings in the outturn of the last national budget, both from the standpoint of performance as well as reporting, the most glaring is that which has to do with the development program. Given the confluence of negative activities which combined to threaten our economic well-being last year, it was clear to the Parliament that the major objective of the new government should be to stimulate the economy by instilling confidence and executing the program of works outlined in the development program. It was in appreciation of this that Parliament approved a budget with a deficit of $7.5 billion, with development spending in the order of $3.5 billion, which should have been carried out between the period October 2010 and September 2011. Mr. Speaker, in his presentation last Monday, the Minister of Finance had, had virtually nothing to say about the performance of the development program. The main reason for this was that the government's performance in this, like so many other things, has been nothing short of scandalously woeful. Of the 3.5 billion allocated, the government was only able to utilize about 1.5 billion. This is the development work spending which should have been done with dispatch to fuel the economy. Mm -hmm. An economy that was showing weak but positive movement that has been allowed to stall and go into recession as a result of the government's general incompetence and a lack of appreciation of the nation's urgent priorities. So when the Minister of Finance talks now, Mr. Speaker, about the need for economic stimulus, he is just being evasive and facetious. He had a stimulus program last year. He blew it. He failed to stimulate the economy last year. The development program was not put to work. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, the government's inability to perform in the development program is inexcusable given the unnecessary deleterious effects that this failure has had on the economy and on the lives of tens of thousands of our citizens. The government had no real funding difficulty during the last fiscal year. They had the leeway to borrow as approved and they got the 1.7 billion windfall from the tax amnesty. They just did not care. It was only when the end of the fiscal year began to stare them in the face that they, that they hurriedly try and attempt to make something do in the last quarter. Even so, the final outturn remained dismal. By way of example, Mr. Speaker, in the Ministry of Local Government, with only one month to go, there was a mad scramble to award a series of contracts across the country on a constituency basis. Mr. Speaker, as a parliamentary representative, I am quite happy to liaise with any minister, any of my colleagues, for the service of my constituents. But I am very uncomfortable with being asked to name contractors for construction job awards, particularly in a questionable system where competitive pricing and transparency seem to be clear casualties. It is the view of the PNM that contracts are to be determined by approved public service processes directed and controlled by public servants. It is a dangerous development for parliamentarians to be invited to select and name contractors for awards, especially when the value of these awards is arrived at in a crash program without reference to the necessary appropriate technical input. Politicians and contractors gathering in a hotel to divvy up the construction budget is not an acceptable procurement process, and this must be frowned upon by all right-thinking citizens. This new development has all the ingredients of mismanagement, waste, and corruption, which should form no part of the execution of the development program. Payment to contractors. Once again, Mr. Speaker, this issue of payment to contractors is before us as a matter to be disputed. 
it was this Minister of Finance who in September 2010 or thereabouts quite erroneously attempted to convince us that contractors' liabilities had largely been discharged since he had made a payment of more than $2 billion to them. When challenged by the opposition, the minister had to admit that it was one of the misses. <coughs> this was to be a mispayment. Mr. Speaker, subsequently, there had been many public announcements of contractors having been paid yet the issue does not go away. Now when confronted with the inaccuracies of these statements from government, their spokespersons deflect the concerns of contractors by saying that they have intractable documentation issues. One state enterprise is now saying that non-payment has to do with forestalling massive fraud on the part of contractors who, according to them, if, they are now, if contractors are owed two million, they are seeking to claim 50 million or thereabouts. Mr. Speaker, whatever explanation or spin the government puts on it, the naked facts are that there are many contractors with overdue certified claims in their possession for which payments are not forthcoming. Mr. Speaker, the real cause of the problem can be found in Appendix 4 of the Minister of Finance's draft estimates for 2012. Under the current account tables, you will see the 2011 estimates of revenue. These are listed at 40.8 billion with a projected deficit of 607 million. That was 2011. The revised figure for that same period, 2011, is 41.8 billion, but with a surplus of 1.62 billion. That's in the current account. What that means, Mr. Speaker, is that the government is simply not paying its bills. All of this is continuing to have a crippling effect on the economy. And they want to know why the economy has declined. In a deficit budget with 7.5 billion, you're showing off a 1.62 billion deficit and not paying people. Mr. Speaker, I want to turn to the area of greatest concern. And that is the decline of the energy, the, the energy sector and that may very well be a disaster in the making. In the late 70s, Mr. Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago witnessed the birth of the national gas industry with the launching of the Point Lisa's industrial estate. I remember this classic phrase of the right honorable Dr. Eric Williams, father of the nation, as he turned the sod in Coover. He had this to say. He had this to say. Now this is my title, anyway. don't lie. He said, Mr. Speaker, sugar has divided us. <coughs> Wire rods will bring us back together. Those words, Mr. Speaker, forgotten by many, remain paramount in the minds of the party, which I now have the privilege and honor to lead. A review of the birth and growth of the energy sector during the past 25 years in Trinidad and Tobago will show the establishment of eight ammonia plants, seven methanol plants, an iron and steel complex, four trains of LNG, the growth of electricity from 300 megawatts to 1,500 megawatts, the production and utilization of natural gas from 3,500 to 33,000 mmCF in the first nine months of 2011, it also shows an establishment of one of the most successful gas processing plants, and we have a per capita income that has grown from 5,699 US in 1980 to $17,000 US by 2010. That's the estimated per capita GDP. We have already said, Mr. Speaker, that this is only because this only became possible because the PNM government gave away the natural gas. What are the facts, Mr. Speaker? The NGC is probably the most profitable company in the Caribbean, with after-tax profits of 2.1 billion in 2006, 2.9 billion in 2007, 3 billion in 2008, and for the first half of 2010, a profit after tax of 1.6 billion. Is this the result of giving away? Or is it that the policies and strategies in the monetization of our natural gas was the correct one. The Trinidad and Tobago model of the gas sector 
is now known and admired throughout the world. Many developed